prankster in the conspiracy. The story of Kerry Thornley and how he met Oswald and inspired the counterculture. Anybody ever heard of uh, Kerry Thornley? There we got one. Well, this, this, this is sure a uh, rabbit hole. Uh, Thornley was one of the founders of a spoof religion called Discordianism, which they cooked up in the uh, late 50. He and a friend of his name, uh, Great Hill. And uh, since that time, over the years, it's continued to evolve as sort of an underground counterculture spoof religion. If you get on the internet these days and look up Discordianism, you'll find all kinds of things about it. That's one aspect of Thornley. The other thing was he served in the Marines with uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in the uh, late 50s. He was actually writing a book about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald three years before the Kennedy assassination. Thornley went later, he uh, appeared before the Warren Commission, actually wrote a, the first book on Oswald, a very slim volume. It was basically one of those tabloid type books to capitalize. It was called Oswald. <clears throat> Time passed. Jim Garrison uh, conducted his investigation. If anybody's seen the movie JFK, that was based on Jim Garrison's investigation. He was the district attorney in New Orleans, and he indicted Kerry Thornley in 1967, claiming that Thornley was one of the people involved with all these other shady characters, if you're familiar with the story, like David Ferry, uh, as being... Uh, involved in the uh, Kennedy assassination or sort of a cover-up team. Garrison claimed that Thornley was one of the Oswald doubles that was running around pretending to be uh, Oswald basically to set him up after the fact as this crazy lone net communist simp running around doing these crazy things. Thornley denied all this stuff. There was witnesses who claimed they saw Thornley and Oswald in the together in New Orleans. But uh, Thornley went adamantly denied this over the years. A few years uh, passed, and uh, let me back up by saying what, while uh, Kerry was in uh, New Orleans, he was there for a period of time, the same time Oswald, prior to the uh, Kennedy assassination, uh, Thornley had gone to New Orleans because he was a budding writer and wanted to talk to people and experience that uh, scene there in New Orleans. He met a couple of shady characters by the name of Gary Kirsten and Slim Brooks. And they had theoretical discussions. They talked about philosophy and politics. And they had a theoretical discussion one time about killing a president, and in particular, JFK. Thornley thought this was once again just a... Uh, theoretical discussion. Fast forward to the early 70s, he came, Thornley came across this book called Coup d'etat in America that stated uh, the premise of this book was that the Watergate burglars, one of them was E. Howard Hunt, was one of the tramps in Daily Plaza that many people say were behind the Kennedy assassination. And in this book they, should, they took overlays of the Watergate burglars and you could lay them over the different tramps and the overlay of E. Howard Hunt matched up exactly with the old man tramp they call him in Daily Plaza. I'm getting pretty deep here, but when Thornley saw that, he went, whoa, that's the same guy I had these discussions with in New Orleans, Gary Kirsten, way back when. And then he felt memories started coming back to them that he'd somehow been manipulated. Uh, perhaps MK Ultra was involved. As you look, as I got deeper into the story, it turned out that Thornley and uh, Oswald both served at a Japan at Tsuki Air Base, which a uh, later article in Rolling Stone revealed they had MK Ultra LSD experiments going on there, and that E. Howard Hunt, then with the CIA, had also worked out at Tsuki. So there's all these weird connections. One connection uh, Thornley had was with Robert Anton Wilson. Any Robert Anton Wilson fans here? I got to know. Bob Wilson, he wrote, wrote the intro to this uh, book, and uh, the first uh, edition of the Illuminatus trilogy is uh, dedicated to Kerry uh, Thornley and Greg Hill, the founders of Discordian, and he was part of this underground Discordian scene. And Thornley eventually suspected, as the mid 70s, Thornley started to talk about going down these rabbit holes. He started going off in the 
deepened perhaps with paranoia and he began to suspect that the Scordian Society was a CIA front and that Robert Anton Wilson was a CIA handler who had somehow brainwashed him. It's pretty deep. But I'd like to read uh, part of Wilson's intro to my book, The Prankster and the Conspiracy. He did a great job on this. It's called Monster in the Labyrinth. Ye have locked yourselves up in cages of fear. And behold, do ye now complain that ye lack freedom? Ye have cast out your brothers for devils, and now complain ye, lamenting that ye've been left to fight alone. And that's from a work called The Epistles to the Paranoids. The Gospel According to Fred by Kerry Thornley. So he, Wilson goes on to write, Kerry Thornley wrote these words in the mid-1960s, and within 10 years he had become a clinical paranoid himself in the judgment of almost all of his friends, including Dr. Robert Newport, a psychiatrist who had known Kerry since high school. The moral of this seems to me, take great care which nutcases you dare to mock, for you may become one of them. I do not write in any spirit of smugness or superiority. I became somewhat paranoid myself for a while there, or at least experienced acute anxiety attacks. For several months I literally could not leave my house without looking around to see if Kerry crouched behind a bush waiting to shoot me. You see, he had become convinced that I worked for the CIA and served as one of his managers or brainwashers, but I thought I worked as a freelance writer and considered myself his friend. As his, later, his letters to me grew increasingly hostile and denunciatory, I began to fear that he might have graduated from weirded out to dangerous. This now seems silly to me, an overreaction, but the violence and paranoia of the Nixon years made everybody in this country feel a bit jumpy. A Black Panther leader in the part of Chicago, in my part of Chicago, seemed to have gotten shot by the local police while sed sedated. The extreme light right and extreme left both had wild conspiracy theories about everything else. Anti-war meetings, anti-segregation meetings, even pot legalization meetings, all had people making nervous jokes about who among us was the government, who among us the government had infiltrated to report on our thought crimes. The government not only appeared irrational and out of control, but so did a large part of the population. I finally moved to Ireland to start a new life as an expatriate, and my worries about Kerry executing me for brainwashing him made up only a microscopic part of my motive. The whole country seemed a bit funny in the head, and I had to hide out and lie low for a while. Silence, exile, and cunning, as Joyce had advised. Looking back, I feel amused and humbled. Like Kerry, I had satirized the paranoids before the sheer number of them frightened me into acting just like one of them. I remember my last phone conversation with Kerry during which he announced that just a week earlier I had come to Atlanta, argued with him about my alleged CIA connections, spiked his drink with LSD and brainwashed him again. I told him that I had not left San Francisco in months and that if he had a bad acid trip the previous week then somebody else gave him the acid, not me. I insisted on this as persuasively as I could. Finally, Kerry relented a bit. Well, maybe you believe that, he said. But that, <laughs> but that means your bosses have been fucking with your head and planting false memories in you, too. <laughs> How do you argue that you haven't had your head altered? Look, I said, I'll put my wife Arlen on. She'll tell you that I haven't left here in months. That won't prove anything, he said, with the calm certitude of a grandmaster announcing checkmate. They probably fixed her head, too. <laughs> I don't remember the last, uh, the rest of the conversation. I felt lost in an Escher painting. Wow. That was Robert that Anton was Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of the original uh, letters, and there was a lot of theories during those uh, periods. And Mae Russell, a late great conspiracy researcher, kind of seemingly picked up on uh, some of this stuff that uh, Wilson and uh, Timothy Leary were these. Uh, mind control agents running around and <laughs> doing odd stuff that this brings up the, the uh, idea of doppelgangers which uh, if I have time here I'll get into it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Wilson died uh, in this celebrated, uh, well celebrated, uh, memorialized the fifth year that he's been dead about a week ago or so and uh, Another thing that appears in Happy Trails to High Weirdness is something I wrote that was in UFO magazine after 
Wilson died, and I called it Raw R.I.P. Riff. Raw Rip Riff. I'll read that. Quote, and so it is that we as men do not exist until we do. And then it is that we play with our world of existent things and order and disorder them. And so it shall be that non-existence shall take us back from existence and that nameless spirituality shall return to the void like a tired child home from a very wild circus, end quote. That's from the Principia Discordia, the Bible of Discordianism. I won't pretend to be among those who were part of Robert Anton Wilson's inner circle, his closest friends and family members that were at his side towards the end when his body filled but his synapses were still firing with the intensity of his words on the printed page. Just the same Bob made everyone feel, inner circle or not, that we are all part of the same Illuminati Discordian conspiracy, fellow passengers on a wild circus ride, whether you were an acne riddled fanboy or conversely a fellow traveler seeking out his guidance and wisdom. I felt an equal measure of both, on the one hand a fawning fanboy fumbling over his words, my words in his presence, meanwhile profoundly influenced by Bob's work, having taken his teachings and applied them to my own life and writing. No one living or dead has had such an effect on me before or since, and I'm now long enough in the tooth that probably no one else will ever be of such influence again. Oh, to be young and happen upon Cosmic Trevor or the Illuminatus Trilogy and have your mind blown in a particularly positive direction. Like a lot of my contemporaries, Ra came into their lives an important imprint juncture and certainly saved more than a few of us from early ruin. These sentiments have been shared with me on more than one occasion by friends who were at a critical turning point when Ra, Robert Anton Wilson, miraculously appeared in their lives in the form of one of his great books, thus re-imprinting their perceptions of the world, or more precisely, he provided them the tools and impetus to, re to re-imprint and reprogram themselves. Bob was famous for being the guy you would call if someone was experiencing a bummer acid trip. Bob could talk them down in a matter of minutes, as he was not only hip to how the human brain functions, but he was also a very caring guy who wanted to leave the world a better place in his passing. Fortunately, I had a chance to meet Ron in the spring of 2001 while researching the prankster and the conspiracy, my book here. In a way, he took me under his wing, but I think a lot of people felt that way, as just being in Ra's presence was always stimulating, educating, and filled with a fair share of laughs, which afterwards left you energized and inspired. There was also the feeling that you were in the company of some sort of Western version modern Buddha with the smiling beati beatific <laughs> Continence and humble demeanor. Of course, Ra was never one to deify himself. In fact, his primary mission, it seemed, was to get us all thinking for ourselves, to free us from the sway of governments and gurus, to be our own masters who make the grass green. However, when my conspirator, Greg Bishop, there snapped the digital photo I was going to show, my Ra's apartment of myself and Bob, I commented on how he appeared almost Buddha like in it. To this observation, Bob seemed pleased with the Buddha comparison, noting that as a younger man he had wished to evolve into something of the joke, something of the sort. I jokingly dubbed the photo, which you don't have a chance to see, the axe murder and the Buddha due to the seemingly mad gleam in my eyes in that photo. At the time, Ra's uh, post-polio syndrome had again reared its troublesome head after many years lying dormant, and so getting around for him was a struggle. With great dignity, Bob made his way about his apartment using a walker, bound and determined not to be beaten by his old adversary polio, with the goal foremost in his mind to eventually walk again unassisted. Really bugged the hell out of him, though he never stated out loud to us that he had to rely on others for the simplest things now. Nonetheless, he accomplished his goal in time of walking unaided, if but for a few brief steps, as demonstrated in the documentary Maybe Logic. Ever the optimist, if Ra was going to talk to talk, then he was, then he damn well knew that he would literally walk the walk as he was a firm believer in the ability of people to heal themselves with positive visualization. Of course, Bob's optimism might have been bolstered in part by an Irishman's bullheadedness. When several months ago, while alone in his apartment, he took a debilitating fall. Unable to get out, up, he lay on the floor for 30 hours until discovered by his daughter, who had to break the door down to get in. 2003, I phoned Ra to ask some follow-up questions regarding Carrie Thornley book. 
While I had Bob on the phone, one thing I always wanted to ask him was how one went about becoming a member of the Bavarian Illuminati, since he'd been long rumored that he was the secret chief of that infernal and equally illustrious order of conniving supermen. Bob, I queried, are you the head of the Illuminati? No, he replied in typical satiric fashion. I'm the toe. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly the answer I was looking for, but just the same, I asked if he could appoint me as an Illuminati high priest, to which he doesn't, didn't hesitate one second. You are hereby appointed. <laughs> <laughs> I have this on tape, too. I need to edit it someday. And although this lofty position hasn't improved my sex life or finances to any measurable degree, <laughs> must admit it is one hell of an honor belonging to a secret order associated with Robert Anton Wilson. During this porter, uh, period, whenever Bob emailed anyone, he'd CC it to John Poindexter, then head of the notorious <laughs> Information Awareness Office, a defense agency overseeing the government's domestic surveillance program which ramped up in the aftermath of 9-11 hysteria. To this end, Bob figured that by sending his email messages directly to Poindexter, it would, in turn, eliminate the need for anyone to maintain surveillance on him, thus eliminating a paid position and cutting down on government waste, <laughs> maybe even lowering our taxes. Besides, Bob added, it amuses me to think of Poindexter reading my emails. In this regard, I asked Bob if they had lifted the idea of the Information Awareness Office logo from the cover of the Illuminatus trilogy. I had a slide I was going to show comparing the Illuminatus to the logo of the Information Awareness Office. Here's me and Bob. <laughs> cool. <laughs> So in this regard, I asked Bob if they had lifted the idea of the Information Awareness Office logo from the cover of the Illuminatus trilogy. Like Illuminatus, the IAO logo featured the all-seeing eye in the triangle in addition to an ominous death ray shooting out from the eye and focusing its malevolent beam over the planet, suggesting an Orwellian nightmare come true, wrapped up in symbolic Masonic imagery so blatant it seemed absurd. Quote, I don't know what the hell's going on, Bob replied. I think we're being taken over by a bunch of surrealists. <laughs> Although Bob's health had rapidly deteriorated in recent years, this in no way slowed down his anti-authoritarian antics, card-carrying discordian that he was. During the California recall election of 2003, Bob tossed his name into the hat, running for governor on the Guns and Dope Party ticket, <laughs> <laughs> whose libertarian platform advocated replacing one-third of Congress with ostriches. <laughs> Probably be an improvement. Another example of this was his participation at a rally in his hometown of Santa Cruz, California on September 7, 2002. At this event, Bob was among a group of medical marijuana patients who, in defiance of a, a federal court order, picked up their medicinal herb from care providers at a rally that received national attention. I remember uh, seeing this made the national uh, newspapers at the time and was on TV. A lot of people didn't realize it was Wilson who showed up there because he changed quite a bit uh, since then. Uh, of course, let's see. Of course, this was a cause that hit close to home with Bob as he was openly defiant of the Bush regime and what he termed the TSOG, Czarist Occupation Government, and its stranglehold on the rights of citizens to receive the medical care of their choosing. I must admit I was taken, a bit taken aback by Bob's physical appearance at the time. He had changed dramatically, like I was saying, since I'd last seen him a mere year and a half earlier, having lost a considerable amount of weight and appearing much frailer. Along with his book royalties, a major part of Bob's income came from his lectures, but as it became apparent that traveling was now too much of a burden, he and some entrepreneurs launched a novel way to earn money and still provide him a forum for interacting with his fans. This was the concept behind the Maybe Logic Academy, where a couple years back Bob started conducting online courses on such subjects as quantum physics, consciousness expansion, and the strange life of Aleister Crowley. 
It was here that I had my last interactions with Bob during the quantum psychology course. One of the reasons I enrolled because I feared Bob wasn't going to be along, around much longer, so I felt I should take advantage of an opportunity to dialogue with him. And though the subject of quantum physics was one I feared I'd never really be able to wrap my head around, I gave it a go anyway. Much to my surprise and delight, Bob opened my eyes once again as after the course's completion, the subject no longer seemed quite so unfathomable. For the skipped and many others, I remain eternally grateful to Robert Anton Wilson. Even though the Maybe Logic Academy appeared to be a successful endeavor, Bob's medical costs escalated dramatically after the fall he took. He was bedridden thereafter, having to pay for in-home in care, which apparently drained Bob's resources to the extent that he began auctioning off rare books and collectibles on eBay to pay his bills. Such are the vagaries of a freelance writer, even one as successful as Bob Wilson. Unfortunately, along with the freedom of being, the being your own boss affords, it also leaves you at the mercy of the American health care system, which toward the end drained Bob of his savings and left him on the brink of being evicted from his apartment. It was at this point that his friends put out the word calling for donations via pay PayPal to help Bob pay his rent and live comfortably during his last days. As soon as I saw the message, I forwarded it to my own email list and sent in what I could afford, hoping that at least a couple dozen uh, more people would step up to the plate for this wonderful fellow who had illuminated so many minds. Shortly afterwards, I got the word that over the course of a couple days, over $68,000 had been raised. This outpouring of love totally blew Bob and his family away, brought much needed comfort at a critical time. A couple weeks before Bob's death, a blog for him was started which now appears as a swan song, his way to say farewell to all the people who had come to his aid during those final days. Bob's last blog entry read, quote, Please pardon my levity. I don't see how to take death seriously. It seems absurd. absurd. I remain, remain cheerful and unimpressed. I look forward without the dogmatic optimism, but without dread. I love you all and deeply implore you to keep the lasagna flying. <laughs> I ended it with Hail Iris, all hail Bob. All hail Bob. Thank you.